Good morning, Dolly. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Rob and Dolly Show. Life to life. How are you in your neck of the woods? <laughs> I rob the same sentence every week. That's great. But today we talk about the book. It is called A Guernsey Promise and was written by us. Yeah. <laughs> Doris Gerlach and Robert Christian Bruce. 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 If you want to do the Ooh, Dutch. Here we go. And we also got help from your mom. She yeah. is an editor, Liz Roy. Mm -hmm. And we have a special supporter today who is Ooh. Paolo Caetano. Mm -hmm. He's a landscape and portrait photographer from Guernsey. Ooh. And he allowed us to use his photographs for our YouTube video. This will be so great. A Guernsey Promise was written in 2015. And um, my English is not so good. And we met, Rob. Yeah. How was it? <laughs> it was, it was, I had just moved to Germany, uh, 2014. I still remember where I was when I got all the information from. So I had a friend, Leslie, and she put me in contact with you. So she's an American and she does translation. And she was, I don't know how you met her or what, how the network was working at the time. But essentially, she told me, says, I, I'm just good at translating. I don't know how to anything about editing. So I just thought, okay, I can perhaps help in this endeavor. And I was in Dresden at the time. So it was amazing because I still remember being in that city and then the beginning of our friendship. So they, they Dresden always has that beautiful memory, that glow. I can still remember all that stuff. And then, you know, the work we did throughout the, the months. I mean, we started in 2014. We ended, I think, in February. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, it was a fun working relationship. I learned a lot about Guernsey. I didn't know. I mean, I I always assumed it, it's it's French, right? I mean, it's is it English or French? Tell me, what do you know? Tell me about Guernsey. <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, Guernsey is a British Crown dependency, okay, and is a forty five minute uh, flight from England. It is twenty five square miles. And uh, you can play Geo Guesser on it. <laughs> it's a great sport there. No, you can do many more things. It was separated from the Normandy 8,000 years ago. And it is a place of inspiration, I can tell you. St. Peter Port is supposed to be the most beautiful town in Europe. But now it is no longer Europe. It belongs to Britain. It belongs to the Queen. So here we go, Rob. Yeah, and w just one more quick question: what What is it about Guernsey that uh, is so attractive? I know you have a story there, but when you were first intrigued by Guernsey, what brought you there? Was it just a, a some mysterious bond? It uh, it was a TV show I watched. Uh, it was a, a criminal show. I can't remember the title, but it was set on Jersey. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then. We, we we went to Jersey and also we took a little trip to Guernsey because Guernsey is a smaller island. Uh, and I fell in love immediately. And I fell so much in love that I got married on that island in 2003 and ever returned each year. So it was like magic spell for me. And when I was in, in conflict, when I had my so-called crisis in life I wanted to break free and I decided to do that to traveling back to Guernsey mm -hmm. and uh, my novel is set there to show how it can go if you want to break free and one more question I'm very curious what is the language there is it just mainly English because I think of again it's, it's, it's it was once part of France right and now it's part of the English so do they speak it, English there it is a Normanic French okay. so you wouldn't understand. I I did not understand it. I spoke to a potato grower, and it is included in the book. And I hardly I I hardly understood a word. But he was very friendly to me, and he always said the Jerry's. So I thought, what the heck is he telling him telling me about? So he talked about war, Second World War, and I learned that the Germans were on that island, and they occupied it, and the islanders had trouble in it. So. I did not include it in the English version, but I included it in the German version. So the English, which I want to read today, 
is a love story of love and betrayal. And um, yeah, so so it goes. I just want to mention one thing. He said Jerry's. That's the Eng- you know that was the British word for the Germans, right? In the mm. First World War. And do you yeah. know why Jerry? No, tell me. Because for the English, when they saw the German soldiers in their helmets, the helmets reminded them of jerry cans. And jerry cans are what you you defecate into when you're in the hospital. Oh, my God. So basically, they were calling the Germans crap heads. Oh, that's not very nice. But, so that's why but the jerrys. That man who I met, he said to me, oh, the war's over, and I, I like the Germans now. That was very friendly. And there's a famous uh, book, and it was filmed. It is called The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. And uh, I love that. I really do. It is a very, it's the most famous piece of mm-hmm. art. <laughs> apart from Victor Hugo, who of lived course. there. And apart from Renoir, who painted there. So everybody who's interested in military arts and movies and dancing and sorcery, <laughs> superstition, should go and visit. So I would like to start now. Please. Any minute now. The sun shone brightly through the oval windows. Tilting her head past the old woman sitting beside her, Hannah could make out the white sparkling reflections of the sea far below. That sheen of warmth on water. She nodded, sighed, then touched the cool metal of the seat belt clasped around her lap. The land began to expand, gain in size from the lowering of the plain, while the murmur of the engine amplified into a growl and the dizziness descent caused her ears to pop from the pressure. When she felt and heard the wheels lower, she shivered with glee. Any minute now. I think you made that piece very nicely. So I like the English, I like the imagery. And uh, I always wondered, Rob, why did you include that metal sound? Because I would have liked to concentrate on nature, but you made it, uh, you focused on, on, on the engine. Well, my parents separated when I was uh, 15, 16. So we, of course, in Canada, we live four or five, you know, hours apart by plane so the image to me like when i'm on an airplane there's something wondrous about that sound of approaching the landing and hearing all those things so when i was imagining hannah we were working on the book at that time that was the imagery i had in my mind because here's your character as an anticipation of a new adventure whereas when i was a teenager this is the first time i'm going to go see my mom with her with her new husband and there's a sense of anticipation, but also fear, excitement, and that feeling of coming down back to earth. It's it's quite beautiful. So the metal sounds, it's part of, I mean, when you think of it, metal comes from nature. And yes, we think about it as almost being alien because through the, the craftsmanship of science and, you know, technology. But that's what came to mind when I was working on that. Very nice. So I like the landing part very much. And... Uh, Then it goes on, her legs felt light, the air here in this place fresher than any air she'd breathed before or since. Walking down the plain steps, she looked up to see that the sky was more than blue, a radiant blue. The clouds, spare and sparse, wandered slowly by, as Hannah took in another deep breath. Even the odor of kerosene and cooling metal felt so refreshing, but soon... Soon she would be breathing the pureness of Guernsey air. Any minute now she would be in her hotel room. The window opened, the salted, scented breeze of the sea wafting through the fluttering the curtains. Yet it was more than just the aroma of the ocean. It was something else, something floral, not brackish as John had once described in an email. Well, he should know. No, perhaps it was the scent of bluebells or blossoming gorse in some nearby English garden. Hannah wondered if the locals purposely created such a scent just for the tourists to seduce them right away. I remember us talking, Rob, about um, what to include in, in flowers. And I told you bluebells, we have a famous bluebell wood on Guernsey. It is marvelous, the blue carpet. 
And you asked me about what is it? What do you have? And you you decided here what to include. And um, again, I must say, it, it is to the point. And in that first passage, we already include John. John is a major character who is a philosopher, photographer. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Paolo Gaetano. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, she has a platonic relationship. So very nice. So nothing dangerous. No. So... And he is the he is the intelligent guy, yes, in the book, and uh, yeah, so it starts. Well, I just thought including John, there's an element of foreshadowing. You want to make sure that the reader has a little bit of intrigue. First of all, she's coming to this new place, so that's everyone can relate to that. And then now we have this question mark: Who's John? Is she here for John? So we have to always add a little bit of mystery here, you know, little little drips and drabs to keep the reader going. And then we made a little trick. Um, the hotel has rooms which are allocated to famous artists. And this hotel exists. Of course, it's not the name. <laughs> no. Um, so inside the double front doors, a lovely, cheerful receptionist with auburn hair welcomed here. Welcome to Sunset Over Guernsey. Distracted, Hannah continued to admire the lobby, the staircase. The floors shimmered. The staircase now all in oak. Yes, truly, everything had been renovated. How light and modern it all looked. While Hannah put her sunglasses down the counter and leaned her luggage against her left leg, the receptionist typed away at the computer. Yes, everything felt refreshed, everywhere renewed. On the way over, she had asked the taxi driver, a woman with a dirty blonde hair, about all the work at the airport. But the latter wanted to talk more about the tourist sites, things to see. Who cares about the airport? Guernsey is more than the airport, the driver said. When did all the renovations start? The girl smiled. It's been a work in progress. I started here last year, but it was mostly done by then. But there are always things to do, room by room. It's almost all completed. One more to go, I think. The new owners are a Russian couple from St. Petersburg, and they decided to be a bit more thematic. They love art and culture, and so we now have rooms devoted to the different artists and writers that lived, worked, or were inspired by Guernsey. We even have a Renoir room with prints of what he painted here. That's interesting. Hannah nodded, still gazing about, and what about Monet? The receptionist handed her a form to fill out. No, Monet wasn't here. Many people think so, but he wasn't. Oh, but let me guess, is there a Victor Hugo room? There is, replete with pictures of the author, his daughter, and the woman he had an affair with. It's kind of like our presidential suite. Mostly businessmen and celebrities stay there. Hannah began to write out her personal information. Any famous people here now? No, but we did have Annette Bening here last year. And Emily Blunt, Kenneth Branagh, actually had lunch here when he was visiting the island for a movie. So I think that's a clever idea you had to oh. com combine history with... Uh, equipment of the hotel and i've seen hotels like that so i just that was the inspiration in the past I, i like the idea of the thematic but it also because victor hugo shows up later in the novel i mean you go to the victor hugo house i can't remember which character or hannah goes sorry but <laughs> you essentially are hannah in the book so <laughs> hannah doris hannah d <laughs> <laughs> so i just thought there'd be a it's also People like to find out stuff about that. I mean, when we read a book, we're traveling to another place. And we're, it's nice to know these little tidbits, these little pieces of information. They're like little breadcrumbs we're following. And it just makes it much more colorful and lively. Lifting the window sash, she took in the much-anticipated air, that mingling mixture of sea and someone's garden. Hannah breathed went all in the landscape and even the mineral scents from off those high walks and walls she couldn't see past, and the lower ones as well. 
it was Matt Bach then who commented on those stone-enclosed English gardens. He thought it was also typically French, from the hints of witchcraft to the stories of Victor Hugo's affair to the memory of Renoir painting on the island. It was true, he loved the place, but being mad, he needed to be critical for the sake of not appearing too drawn in. Hannah had tried to ignore his remarks, then, as she did now. Maybe it was a man thing. Maybe he didn't want to let on that he was taken by the beauty and mystery of the island. Matt's default position was the distance and cynical. Most likely a default setting in the male chromosome, Hannah now thought. But John wasn't like that. No, he was the opposite. In his emails he had enthused about the island, his character and beauty. Where Matthias thought the stories of witchcraft and ghosts ridiculous, John couldn't resist telling her all kinds of tales. She loved those emails the most. Now we have attention, the love triangle, a little bit. <laughs> right? Yeah, it is. So uh, the question is, um, to me, um, she she could have come together with John. I mean... Obviously, she's out for a journey, so and she she decides against this John, who is everything she loves. One thing she does not love is that he is the same nice guy like her husband at home. So he's not the bad one. He's not the exotic. He's not nothing out of the ordinary. All he has in himself, she has in herself. So that is the reason why... It is just a friendship on her side. But the tension rises, of course, <laughs> as love does. The question is, why do people break out? So if they are in a crisis, they, they wish to f fall in love with life. Uh, they wish to uh, escape from uh, the vacuum cleaner, from the washing machine. You might know that, Rob, yes? So well, what do you do when you want to break out? Well, I've been reading this book called The Wild the Wild Edge of Sorrow. And he talks about in the book the idea of the sort of gray world we live in, so this gray reality. And when people break out of that reality, it's because I think they're grieving for the reality. They They feel like they already knew that should be here, but it's not. So I think when people break out, it's because that their humanity is being suffocated by this existence that inc includes bureaucracies, taxes, schedules, time plans. It, it just seems like this sort of world we're living in is almost like this carbon copy of a better world, but it's printed on a carbon copy paper. So it feels thin and meaningless. So I think when people break out, that's their... I mean, that's that, you know, what Walt Whitman talked about, the yop, you know, this sort of cry out from themselves to, to be free, to seize the moment, carpe diem. I think breaking out is almost like, uh, I think it's natural. I think it's probably yes. psychologically more sound than participating in a world that would rather, you know, rub you down into a point of you're just an entity, you're just a number. I mean, I think about uh, Victor Hugo and Jean Valjean, his number from prison. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to break out, you go to a strange country, but Hannah goes to a place she absolutely knows. So she rents a room. She rents the same room she was married in. Uh, so she has no intention of starting a love affair or anything. It's just a friend. Yes, she met uh, on the Internet and she likes his interests. So it's nothing planned here. She just wants to go and write in a familiar surrounding and maybe start living there because she seeks a job there. Um, and she says about um, to her lover later about her husband, but we live such separate lives now. When I was younger, I think I loved the future in him, the possibilities. Now I love only the past, the part that was going to happen and never did. If I miss anything... It is the woman I was ten years ago. I think if I had listened to myself more back then, it would be different. I think that's the center, center sentence. Well, I think she's going or, through a grief. This idea yeah. that you want to go through the places that are familiar to you to sort of sense what you've lost. 
and that's what I like about this book I'm reading. He he remarks on grief as a form of praise, the idea that the what we lost, what we grieve for, held such meaning. So she's coming to the place that when in, in her earlier days she felt such a it represented hope for her. So immense, yeah, she's she's grieving that old hope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you were able to have a look out of one of those windows from one of these uh, small hotels, it is immense. We have a high tide. We call it uh, 12 meters. Yeah. This is very high. And uh, if you if you want to do cliff paths walking, it's the most beautiful you ever can do. You have secluded beaches just for your own sake and your own p- private life. Mm-hmm. And uh, nature, surrounded by this beautiful St. Peter Port, which is the town she goes to by bus. The bus took half an hour to get into St. Peter Port. Hannah watched the scenery breeze by the green hills and the distant beach. Anything was possible, she thought. Tilting her head, a sly grin formed at the corner of her mouth. In St. Peter Port, she could feel the busy energy of people. The whole town seemed to be astir, alive with conversation, with bustling bodies. High Street awash with town people and tourists. Many had erupted from the boats shuttled from the cruise lines. Vigorously they snapped pictures of the blue telephone booths and mailboxes using digital cameras, large and small. They were distinguished from the locals by their knapsacks, fanny packs and the general look of awe upon their faces. For those who lived on the island, they simply drifted by on their bikes, gazing bemusedly at the traffic. Many worked in the ubiquitous restaurants, cafes, shops, answering questions, taking orders, selling trinkets, smiling and nodding. The retired ones, the ones who took their time, sat at their favorite places to play chess, read or watch the daily circus at a safe and slow remove. The tourists thronged and wandered the streets, crowded the restaurants and cafe tables while slender servers weaved in and around the chairs. And tables like practiced contortionists holding up platters of cheese, wine, sometimes tea and sometimes other dishes that catered to their differing tastes depending upon their home country. Hannah wondered if it was too early for oysters but immediately saw one plate go quickly by as she stood outside a jam-packed restaurant. That answered her question. So it is the contrast, yes, if you want to feel people <laughs> but marry people just go and visit St. Peter Port but at the same time when you're going to a place like that it's it's ironic that you're really going to a place filled with tourists like yourself so you're not really experiencing Guernsey and that's the one thing I always found because uh, coming from Ontario nearby there was Niagara on the Lake and when you visit Niagara on the Lake it's it's picture perfect it's a picturesque little town but it's it's the ideal version of a village like environment. This is not a living village. This is like it's almost like a museum piece. So when I was thinking when we were working on that section, I just thought about Niagara Lake. And again watching especially in the small there's a place called the Angel Inn in uh in Niagara Lake. It's a haunted place. And I just remember always the the servers having to squeeze by all the tables. Mm-hmm. Again being <laughs> contortionists because it's such a little compact little yeah, a little, little cafe slash uh, pub restaurant. And I mean, places like that are beautiful. And I mean, typically when we go out into the world and we visit other places, the best things to see are actually other people and how they're enjoying it themselves. Is. Oh, yes. It's so nice. We are curious about each other. And that thing is human nature. I think the best places mm-hmm. to live and the best places to travel to provide you, uh, as uh, Baudelaire talked about in the 19th century, this whole picture gallery of daily life. <laughs> yes, daily life you have in one town. Yes, oh my God. <laughs> compact, packed right in. It. Yes. All the little stories going on at each little table. From the path, Hannah got off her bike and stood to catch her breath. From here, she gazed at the afternoon sun sparkling on the water. Hannah had to catch her breath again. The beauty of steep hills, 
the beach below, the distant sailboats, was too much. Do you want to stop? John asked, anxiously scanning his companion's face. She didn't. She wanted to keep going, but they paddled slower on their bikes. It was amazing, though. It all reminded her of a painting she'd seen but couldn't remember the name or the artist. An impressionist, maybe, or more a romantic landscape, something found in Corot or Daubigny, maybe even Friedrich. Yet the magic of the view, of the place, of the moment had its charm, but it wasn't romantic. Maybe it depended upon the company one keeps. They rambled further along the cliff. The conversation from last night continued, but this time John didn't mention anything personal. Yet with the view and the hills, there were other distractions like the climb that grew increasingly steep. When there was time in between talk of works and plans for the future, she asked John about their surroundings. Happily, he pointed out things to her. A falcon flying overhead, a rabbit darting into hiding. On some higher rocks, he showed her where a seagull had built a nest and they could even hear the tweets of babies. Finally, they arrived at Petibo Bay. A white Martello tower stood in the middle of the beach. There was something simple and innocent about the building. They heard laughter and jiddy screams. Children were playing with their fathers, running around the tower, or playing hide and go seek. Hannah watched the families, but there was something, an itch in the back of her throat that bothered her. Her eyelids felt heavy. Hannah blinked and sighed. She tried to, but couldn't imagine, Matthias as a father. She couldn't see him down here on the beach, taking the time to chase and lift up and tickle his children. One has to be available to be a dad. And when she thought of a son or a daughter in her life, Hannah saw her taking on most of the parental duties. Yet how much she wanted to have children. This is a sad episode. Yeah, I think it is. And mm. I don't know if that was based on what we talked about or something that we discussed with you. I mean, I don't know if you wanted kids because, I mean, Hannah's based on you. So I don't know if we added that. I mean, did you want kids? I no. Don't... Yes, it is really. This is mm -hmm. this is a real true episode. Okay. And I really experienced that episode there in this place with that man. Of course, it is another one. Mm -hmm. But he exists. And uh, I have his allowance okay. <laughs> to say so. So... This is truth. This speaks from my heart. And I thought I must include it as it is. Yes. Yeah, because, I mean, this this character is going through kind of grief because it's it's the world that was supposed to be that never came. Yeah, and I just want to say, right. like, all the, all the going back through this reading and it's bringing back memories, but I have to also have a shout out for my mother with... I mean, one thing I love about her is that her ability to sort of shave off the unnecessary. She knows what moments to pick, what to highlight. So that's one thing I've always been very uh, blessed to have is her as my editing. And, you know, she helped with this book, too, as well. So for everything that's moved smoothly, we have, uh, of course, her to thank. So I just want to have to do a shout out there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mom. You remember the promise, the promise... Uh a Guernsey promise, it is that title because uh, her lover, who I would not, I don't want to read from now because we want to cut it short. Mm -hmm. um, it is a promise he gives to her. He says one sentence, I remember, uh, he says like, love is something that never dies. So it is like a promise when you hear something like that. So before somebody says to you, I love you, and then he says, love never dies. It is like a promise. And that promise is broken, but not intentionally. It's, it has certain elements to it. It is an entangled in a triangle. <laughs> and this book has love scenes. Uh, so I have a, I have somebody who read it, and uh, it is a she, and she was absolutely shocked. Oh, come on, I, I think we made it very tame. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was PG-13 in terms of my perspective. I mean, it's it's not eroticism by any stretch. But you never know. You never. It is like she said, it is a sex book. Yes. Come so on. I heard it from another party and I couldn't believe it. 
And yesterday, I, I read the love scenes again, so everybody should make up his mind. But I mean, if you include a lover in a book, there should be sex scenes in it, shouldn't there? Well, I mean, you can handle them tastefully. I mean, the whole idea of the train going through the tunnel, I mean, that is <laughs> North by Northwest, a Hitchcock film, which was not really meant to, they just had to shoot a scene and, you know, the montage, the connection just happened to get a laugh out of the audience at that time. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I've, I don't know if you've read like Philip Ross from the United States. I mean, his books are, oh, I hate it. I can't stand his books. I mean, yeah, that's right. I just said it. I hate yeah, it. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I heard you. I was just, I was trying to, yeah, I, I don't feel comfortable. I think sex scenes are, I mean, let's put it this way. It's not really necessary to hear the grunting and the moaning between two characters. If you just give a vignette or a slight indication through a look, that's a glance, right. and then you just insinuate something that's all you need to do yes so um in in guernsey um i was also lonely um always yes first with my husband and then later when i returned and wanted to write and find a job so it is like no you you can't break out it is uh, it is just a dream world yes y you must come to terms with your own self Nobody can help you. It is your task only. And uh, coming back to, to sexual desire, I thought it was most difficult uh, to describe certain elements of being intense with another man. That was very hard job for me to describe because I didn't want to be simple and pragmatic or prude. this is just what you said yes this is it it really this was really handcrafted we have to find a balance and of course with those scenes. that was the reason the first reason why i said no i need i need an expert of the english language for that i can't do it the words in the dictionary don't suffice no. <laughs> well, it's also what what the expectations of a love scene in english versus what's in german you know that's how do you translate certain things because I find, okay, as an English native speaker, when I see the word penis, it just takes me out of the, the writing. It just it feels like it's so anatomically descriptive. It feels like, in sorry, I had to say, in your face, and that's uncomfortable for most people. And then there's other words in English. It, we just don't have a, a vocabulary to sort of soften the, the sex scene. So I think, yeah, it's very difficult. It's a balancing act. I mean, there's there's such harsh words like genitalia, Member, they, they strike. Yeah, don't, don't mention them. <laughs> no, they just strike me as as um, it's almost has a sterility to it. I hate to use that word too, but it's yeah, it's it's graphic, but also banal and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is why I love the scenes where uh, we decided to put the characters in certain circumstances, like uh, the little chapel, which is made of porcelain which is very pretty, and married people go there. Uh, she went there with uh, her exotic lover and did not tell him that she wa has gone there before with her husband. So she hides it from him in the first scene. The Victor Hugo Museum, which is so nice and pretty in St. Peter Port, she goes with John. We decided to take John there. And the underground military hospital that still exists today, which is very sobering experience, she went there with her exotic lover. And he was full in praise and excitement about the architecture. And she couldn't breathe because of what was behind that story. So we connected certain scenery of Guernsey with um, with the love story Certain characters. and i thought that was nice i like that very much well i think i think sometimes the in well oftentimes the interests of certain characters what they see can tell us a lot for instance when i was revising my own book recently there's a scene where the, the two grandparents come to get their grandchildren so i just thought to distinguish between the two sisters you have the grandfather basically reaching for the younger granddaughter because she's a wild one whereas anna her her character is very protective, so she grasps her grandmother's hand. It's not so much that she needs to do it, but she needs to do it, she feels, for her grandmother. 
And I feel like characters can be revealed in the environments that they are being mm-hmm. placed. How, mm-hmm. What do we look at? What is important for us as a character? Mm-hmm. There's a scene in a Tarkovsky film where a man is in a hotel room, and as he's entering the bathroom, habitually, he's reaching for where the light switch would be in his own place. But in the hotel room, it's a different environment. So the idea of habits and what we're accustomed to really informs us of how we react to new spaces. And these mm-hmm. characters, I, especially with John being the intellectual, so of course he want to showcase Victor Hugo, but your character reacted quite emotionally. And I thought that was very important when we, we put that together in the book. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I, f- I think it works very nicely. So when we finished that project, it, um, it uh, didn't stop uh, in me thinking and pondering. So later on, I, I wrote a German book. It's called Wie Einst Victor Hugo. Okay. <laughs> you see, that one catches. And uh, we will do another show yes. in German, yes, uh, another week about that book. It is completely different because what left was what was left behind was not the love story. That is just the beginning. You must go deeper to find yourself. I was sure about that. And I, from searching material, I invented a story um, about sorcery and about the Second World War. So let's see how it goes. Ich freue mich drauf. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yes, and I'm looking forward to your German. Well, I will brush so up. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening for much. today's show. And go to Guernsey. It really is worth yeah, the trouble. Sich. It's worthwhile. <laughs> <I'm> preparing. <laughs> bye bye, Rob. Bye bye, Dolly. Thank you for today and have a wonderful Friday. And all our listeners as well. Thank you. Bye.